Okay, friends, let's take a look at the last view, the stewardship view. Uh, this is a view that has been dominant in the Christian tradition. Okay, and if you look at the text, while dominative anthropocentrism has been the target of increasing criticism, I'm reading at the bottom of 350, other philosophical perspectives argue in favor of anthropocentrism with a human face. Okay, along these lines, stewardship anthropocentrism, or simply stewardship, is a philosophy based on the idea that humans transcend nature but should act as stewards of it. Humans, in this view, are the central fact of Earth, and only they possess dignity and authentic rights. Okay, on the stewardship view, at least in its theistic versions, which is the classic uh, Christian view, um, God has entrusted the Earth to human beings, okay, and humans have been given a fiduciary duty over the earth to improve it just as they would do if they were stewards. Okay, a steward in the medieval model is someone who takes care of the lands when the landlord is absent. The nobility, uh, when the noble is off, uh, you know, on wars or on crusade or whatever, the, the steward takes care of the land. And on the stewardship model, humans have been tasked with taking care of and improving the earth. And the stewardship model says that uh, human beings are special. We are the ones with responsibility for this. But it's not that we are special for our own sake. It's rather that we have been given a special role for the sake of something else. Not, again, let me reiterate, on the stewardship view, human beings have been given a special task or a special role, not precisely so as to advance their own interests, but rather so as to advance the interests of something else that would not be as well off without human involvement. Okay, and on the stewardship view then, the anthropocentrism is always anthropocentrism for the sake of something else. Not just anthropocentrism as such on the anthropocentric view, Rather, it is um, anthropocentrism for the sake of improvement of the earth. Okay, now, some have interpreted this special designation that humans have uh, as a, an opportunity to spoil the earth. Okay, the dominion view, for instance, is that God's given us the earth, and we can do with it as we please, because God has given it to us. And this is a view that uh, fortunately isn't especially popular these days, although you do still sometimes hear it articulated. But it was popular in the 19th century, back when um, humans weren't doing as much damage to the environment as we are now. And the view is, is quite simply that human beings, having been given the earth by God, can spoil it if we want to, because it is ours, ours to do with as we please. Okay. Um, but I don't think that there's much scriptural grounding for that, to be honest. I think there's a whole lot more scriptural grounding for the view that we have been given uh, stewardship over the earth for the sake of its welfare, not for the sake of ag uh, self-aggrandizement at its expense. Okay? One of the reasons why in the Old Testament they have all these cleaning rituals and everything, God said it's even because the sin polluted. Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, that shows a care for the land. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can find uh, the stewardship view like dating all the way back to the beginning of the Mosaic Law. Yeah. Its presence uh, from basically the beginning of the Hebrew founding uh, documents. Um, and it, it is certainly present all throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament as well. It is the dominant view in the, in the scriptural texts. Okay, uh, the stewardship view has a bunch of ramifications uh, that are important. I want to do a case study today, so I want to pause here and ask if there are questions or comments before I turn to a PowerPoint briefly. At least I think I have time for a case study. Okay. Adriana, could you grab the lights, please? Oh, wrong lights. Yep. 
let's talk about SeaWorld. Here we go. Okay, SeaWorld, well-known uh, marine zoological park. Uh, who has been to SeaWorld before? All of us? Almost all of us. Had a bad experience? Oh no, what happened? Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> I have had some bad bee stings before, so I know how that feels. I got stung on my eyelid. Yeah, yeah, like the, like a big swelling, like that. but not at SeaWorld. Okay. Um, SeaWorld opened its first park in 1964. It has three U.S. locations. San Diego, San Antonio, and Orlando. I have been to the San Diego one. Probably most of us have been to San Antonio. Is that correct? Okay. Um, here's Shamu. Okay, SeaWorld has lots of attractions. Okay, they've got coasters. They've got animal exhibits. They've got otters. They've got dolphins. But the historic reason why people have come to SeaWorld at least why they always did go to SeaWorld, dating back some years, is the circus-like Shamu shows. It's really entertaining, okay? And I hope you guys have been able to see some of these shows. Yes? A few of us? Okay, it's cool to sit up next to the pool and get, like, massively splashed when Shamu comes by and, like, watch the trainers ride uh, the orca and uh, watch all that going on. It's a lot of fun. Okay, by 2009, SeaWorld uh, was a very successful company valued at $2.5 billion. Okay, um, they had over a billion dollars in income, uh, income annually and roughly 6.5 million visitors per year. Okay, and like I said, they built a big kind of a, a, a whole theme park enterprise around the idea of live sea animals that people could see and that would do shows. And this was a niche thing. It's different than other theme parks, right? Disney builds their theme parks around their movie characters, their Disney Plus characters. Uh, Six Flags has kind of co-opted other characters and focuses on coasters. And they're not native Six Flags characters. They, like, bought the brand. So it's sort of a bolt-on brand. Okay? But SeaWorld has this organic niche built on uh, zoological, live, live zoological shows. Okay. Uh, all of this came to a screeching halt uh, several years ago. Okay, when expert trainer, orca trainer Don Branchot was fatally injured. Okay, she was attacked by a 12,000 pound whale named Tilica. SeaWorld executives initially blamed the incident on the trainer, but it became evident after just a short period of time that this was actually not the case. She was doing her job correctly. This is a really um, sordid kind of an incident. The orca dragged her to the bottom of the pool and sat on her, okay? Not a fun way to go. Okay, but then as the investigation continued, and as the executives at SeaWorld began to tell more lies, certain things were uncovered. For instance, Tillicum's living conditions they were very poor. Okay, so here's a graphic of this. This is the, the show pool. And this here in the red circle is actually the pool where Tillicum spent most of his life, or most of his time in life. Okay, as you can see, he's as big as the pool. Okay, and they did this for cost savings. Because it's a lot cheaper to keep the orca pinned up in the little pool than to let him roam free in the big pool. And Tillicum had been acting out for a while, ever since they had put him in little pools, okay, since he was a young, you know, youth, adolescent orca. He had done other kinds of attack-like things to trainers. He wasn't the only one, actually. Other orcas had as well, as soon as they had begun, you know, the, 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 the parks had begun stowing them away in these um, tiny, tiny, uh, conditions. All right, OSHA got involved. OSHA argued that SeaWorld put its employees at great risks when putting them in the pools. This is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. After the attack on Dawn, SeaWorld had already implemented some new safety procedures to try to forestall an OSHA investigation. 
But it wasn't enough, and OSHA pushed for rules regarding the proximity of the orcas and the trainers. Okay, basically, they told SeaWorld to take a hike. It was time to end these circus-like performances because this was putting the trainers' lives at risk. Okay, the public got involved. A bunch of people began picketing outside of SeaWorld. To enter SeaWorld theme parks, you had to run a gauntlet between lines of people on both sides holding uh, signs saying things like captivity kills. SeaWorld fought back with its own propaganda. SeaWorld recognized that the important bond between mother and calf. They had come under criticism as the investigation expanded. They'd come under criticism for uh, their separation tactics. They would find orcas in the wild and separate the mothers and the calves and uh, take the calves away from the mothers and things like that. And then when a calf would be born in, in captivity, they would immediately uh, separate it from its mother and feed it in other ways so that um, they could, so they would be more docile, so they could control it. And there were stories about, you know, the calf being on the other side of the park and calling to the mother and the mother calling to the calf and they can't reach each other and that sort of thing is, is all, um, is definitely very, very heart-wrenching for the environmentalists. Okay, a documentary came out, Blackfish, who has seen this? A couple of us, yes? Okay. Uh, the documentary was released in 2013. It shed light on the effects of orca captivity and highlighted SeaWorld's uh, unethical practices toward their employees and the community. This documentary gave SeaWorld a world of trouble. Okay. Um, Blackfish premiered in 2013. And SeaWorld stock plummeted. <laughs> their attendance at their parks plummeted too because a bunch of people began boycotting the parks. So imagine you're a SeaWorld executive here you have this very successful business model built around the circus-like performances. And suddenly you're faced with heavy public opinion opposed to these practices. You've been keeping the orcas. You've been able to fund this circus-like model by virtue of cost-cutting measures where you keep the orcas in these tiny little pins. And that improves your margins, but it also enables you to run these circus-like performances. And now you have strong public opinion opposed to this sort of thing. So what do you do? Aren't there like shutting down so it's like once all like the sea world doesn't like get any more money that's it from that standpoint or that like this new business and that they don't want to call it again? Yeah, so they're not shutting down Sea World as such, at least that's not my understanding. But they are shutting down the circus like performances. Okay. And they're not bringing in any more orcas into the program. So they can't just release the orcas into the wild because if they do, now that they've been tamed and all, like, uh, they won't know how to fend for themselves and all that. Then they couldn't chlorine the water rather than salt water with that chemical Oh, really? Yeah. And they oh, I didn't know that. that. So yeah, so they, they could shut the program down faster? There. No. Oh, okay. That's what they did. As, I think in Blackfish it had said that. Like, okay. they start lying and saying, like, oh, because we put them in, like, the tank and stuff. No way. I didn't realize that. And then wow. they were also breeding the whales with um, on one of the aggressive males. And so that's why a lot of them were becoming aggressive because um, because the dad was super aggressive. Mm -hmm. But which was actually like harming the employees. Wow, I didn't I didn't realize that. I actually have not seen the documentary oh, myself. Yeah, so I've seen the documentary. Yeah. Um the execs at SeaWorld, what they actually decided to do was to end these performances and to end the breeding programs. They have an orca experience, but that's going to be wound down because they're not add, actually adding any more orcas to the program. This is a real complex situation, and they're going to have to pivot in coming years to figure out uh, what to do to keep people coming back. Okay, People do want to go to this kind of a park. It's fun to see animals and ride coasters and you know give the kids a good day and that sort of thing. Uh, but at the same time, the main attraction is now going to no longer be there. Uh, so SeaWorld is continuing to struggle. They have struggled a lot in recent years. And we'll see what they do going forward. Questions or comments? Now I'm trying to solve the business problem, but they're trying to be a zoo and an attraction. Both of them. At the same time. At the same time, so yeah. So if they had teamed up with the zoo and allowed them to take 
because of the regulations and they'll make it to the public attraction part, maybe that would they're trying to pursue a sort of a hybrid zoo theme park model. Yeah. Which is kind of unique, right? I mean, the I idea of combining the animals and the coasters, like that's something that's kind of unique. It's smart. But mm -hmm. Right now, I don't know if they have the money to do the zoo thing anymore. Yeah, well, they've been, they've been hammered by a declining attendance. So um, I think going forward, I think they're going to find a niche, but it's probably going to be a less successful niche than the spectacular success that they've had as a company. I think it's going to be some sort of an aquarium-like niche where you can uh, ride coasters while going to an aquarium-like experience. I think that's probably what it's going to be going forward, but not a circus anymore, so can't do that. Okay, that's all i got for today. It's good to see you all. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions about your papers, please uh, shoot me an email. I will try to respond as quickly as I can.